this is the first book talk of leftwards talking red book series uh, as when he mentioned we plan to host this um, every month uh, on a second saturday uh, and this is uh, we will be talking about labor matters today a concern that underpins most if not all of leftwards publications the may 2023 edition of the tricontinental dossier on the condition of working lives in india uh, notes that due to the lockdown at least 120 million workers or uh, 45% of india's non agricultural workforce um, lost their jobs so given the trends towards casualization and subcontracting that has marked employment over the last several decades employers were under no moral or legal obligation to pay their workers many of whom did not even receive their back wages the 2023 oxfam report notes that a uh, number of hungry indians increased to 350 million in 2022 from 190 million in 2018 simultaneously uh, from march 2020 to march 2022 the years that we saw uh, the harshest period of the pandemic but uh, harshest period of the pandemic we saw the profits of india's big businesses that doubled as did the wealth of the country's billionaires Uh, the oxfam report says that this new india is evidently about the survival of the richest it is in this context that we have archana agarwal and ram prakash join us today with their books uh, both books come from very different disciplinary vantage points um, as you will find uh, in this conversation uh, they also have very distinct writing practices and yet it is fabulous to see how they come together in their own distinct styles we could just start with you archana and i'd love to hear from you about how you came to write this book but in particular also this uh, informal research group that you begin this uh, the book with right that you tell tell us about perspectives um, as this group that you started work with and, and tell us something about this collective process of writing so uh, over to you first of all i would like to thank leftward not only for giving home to my book but also for producing such a fabulous book i mean it's it looks beautiful uh now my journey has been as they be mentioned a little unusual in the sense that uh, the destination of the journey was not supposed to be this book it was a little unplanned and yes it's been collective in fact it's been collective even till date as part of the economics discipline my interest lay essentially in looking at how the economic policies impact the lives and livelihoods of people so that was uh, my departure point in many many ways so it's only as part of that that in early 2000s uh, sometime in mid 2000s uh, i founded this uh, informal research group with students and like minded teachers and it was called perspectives so as part of this group what we would do is that we would basically go and try uh, and do surveys and uh, interviews uh, with farmers with workers and try and understand how economic policy and laws impacting them now the group folded up around 2014 but uh, i was compelled to keep going and do these visits uh, sometimes by myself sometimes with people uh, essentially essentially to try and understand how uh, the labor processes in the manufacturing sector are panning out it was only in 2020 when lockdown impacted all of us so that's when the actual process of writing began because there's also been a gap in the existing uh, literature in the sense that either there is uh, i mean either there is economic analysis devoid of the people who economic policies are impacting or the human interest stories which don't really have analysis with them so much so so partly it was also to bridge that gap in a similar way we have uh, ram prakash whose book for me um, at least made me sit up with this whole very distinct writing style right uh, there was this experiment with the writing style i think that one encounters when you first pick up the book uh, the author you encounter the author in the first person in the third person sometimes as a narrator sometimes as a person who's bearing witness um, and then there's also this fantastic 
uh, kind of tapestry of Ambedkar, of Judith Butler, of Toni Morrison, of Father Stan Swami. So this is a very rich quilt that you've woven, Ram Prakash. So could you tell us a little bit about, you know, your journey to the book? When you do the academic writing, then I was also feeling some kinds of disconnect that I was not able to connect with the people. I also come from a street theater background where this whole idea was to like, you know, how to connect because I was not able to practice my street theater with some kind of different regions. And then this writing mode was giving me some kind of a space where I could have articulated my anger, my passion, my all different kinds of like you know, concerns that I can talk about. So what I will say that like, you know, still I'm not sure about the language that I'm using because I was never trained in writing language. I, the like you no know, school that I attended in Bihar, like you know, we never had that kinds of grammar either for like you no know, Hindi language or for English language. And therefore I think the writing that you are seeing or as a readers are going to see is a completely distinct because it is not coming from some kinds of grammar or some kinds of like you no. Know. So it is some kinds of resonance that I'm trying to bring it here. And here I'm going to, uh, you know, kind of go back to Archana's foreword of the book and borrow from Amit Bahaduri, who writes that the book uh, pursues a subaltern economics, a narration by people directly affected, buttressed with, and the book is buttressed with data for wider relevance. And, you know, we are constantly thrown terms like global supply chain, living wages, market wages, economic insecurity, and so on, many of which uh, Brahma also alludes to in a different language in his book. Uh, but I was wondering if Archana and Archana could give us some of these, uh, an overview of the book to begin with, uh, so that the, the audience and the reader uh, is also aware of what has gone into the book, but also share some of some account of these lived experiences of these terms, right? So we're fed some of this policy discourse, but then what is the lived experience of some of these terms that your book rich, richly captures? So what I've done is that I have taken two segments of India's manufacturing sector, I've taken the garment industry and the automobile industry. So essentially, because both are part of the sector, both are part of manufacturing, but yet one is at the lower end and one is at the higher end. So the reason why I'm looking at manufacturing is also because uh, the development stories historically have largely been about the importance of manufacturing. So I wanted to see how, uh, how manufacturing and the work processes in manufacturing are panning out. So what I've done is, uh, in the interviews with the workers, as I mentioned earlier, spanning over a number of years, so I tried to understand their working conditions, their living conditions, the impact of the policies, impact of the laws, etc. And, and uh, I've tried to look at where they live. Uh, I've, of course, focused on NCR. So in fact, it's very interesting because, you know, I'm focusing on uh, uh, so the main cluster of uh, garment manufacturing in NCR is Udyog Bihar and Gurgaon. And uh, for automobiles, it's Manesar and Gurgaon. Now, this is also the area where you have absolutely posh farmhouses. But behind those farmhouses, it uh, one doesn't even realize that there's such a huge cluster of almost slums. Uh, in Kapas Hira, Dhunda Hira, which is where most of the garment workers live. So to just give you an idea, so for the garment workers, most of them are still completely attached to the land, the migrant workers, and they're attached to the lands that they have in their villages. In fact, it's the villages which are subsidizing their living and working in the city, not the other way around, as one would imagine. So those are the kind of things I'm trying to look at. Then I'm also looking at, apart from the work conditions, I'm also trying to examine the, the legal landscape in which these industries operate, where I'm, I'm trying to understand why uh, there is a rollback of protections which workers in general enjoy. Uh, and then finally, there is also an attempt to try and understand what could be an alternative growth trajectory for the country as a whole, where manufacturing can play an important role and where uh, the benefits of the growth can also translate and transform into bettering the lives of these workers. So the first thing I'm going to be reading are these accounts of uh, garment workers which have stayed with me. Uh, this is beginning of my chapter three 
where uh, you know this this was an as early as 2014 it's 10 years back but the situation is more or less the same and the story has stayed with me so so let me start it was a summer of 2014 i was on a bus with a group of young students headed to kapasera where we hoped to meet some apparel industry workers we were going on a sunday because it was a weekly holiday for most workers half way through the journey which was more than half an hour from the starting point of the bus at isbt kashmir gate we realized that some of our co-passengers were garment workers i heard my young friends squealing in delight when they realized that these workers produce garments for abercrombie and fitch and high end casual wear brand i was tutored about the details and nuances of this brand amongst those on the bus was ramesh a 35 year old worker he and the other workers were returning from chor bazaar which is a well known flea market in old delhi they had used their holiday to travel more than 30 kilometers to the flea market to buy second hand clothes for their children the irony of the situation was not lost on us having spent their lives draping the world in some of the most famous brands these workers could only afford old t-shirts worth rupees 35 for their children so these stories have stayed with me there are many many such stories and what i've tried to understand in this book is that i mean it's not that the workers are not getting minimum wages they are getting minimum wages they are not they are not like uh, uh, well they are not really marginalized as one imagines the marginalized workers are but despite working in the manufacturing sector why is it that while working even for 20 years in the garment industry the worker cannot buy a new shirt or the worker is still living in poverty uh, virtually at the poverty levels or in the manufacturing sector where there is a small proportion of workers who are very highly paid why is it that increasingly most workers are getting jobs which are more insecure temporary contractual more precarious what was recurring while reading the book but also from what you just shared the accounts that you just shared was the question of not just the workplace right but what happens after the workplace so it's not just the question of exploitation at the work site but everything else that is necessary to all the other infrastructures that go into making life happen right for example food clothing and so on or you know your children's futures and so um, i felt like here uh, while archana's book uh, adopts an economic lens which is infused with these lived experiences um ram prakash shifts to a different register and brings in the body so the body that archana was referring to in terms of body nichod jata hai that she referred to the worker at the automobile uh, uh, at the yeah automobile factory who was you know spent exhausted depleted at the end of the day and uh, ram prakash brings this body into focus and talks about uh, well not just the harsh sweatshop work conditions but also beyond that right has the the various registers at which pram prakash is engaged with the question of the body and uh, specifically i'm going to quote ram here and where he says that the uh, epic tragedies and violence have to have an epic writing response uh, they cannot be captured by stating fa- facts and information alone and so can you tell us about these different bodies and sites that your bo- book engages with so one way of reading this book is that it is a book of essays where you have like no eight disparate essays but i think other way of reading the book is also book is a consolidated kinds of like no some kinds of criticism or some kinds of trying to attempt some kinds of connections to two keywords and that would be curtailment and resistance because when i was writing earlier then i given this title like no subtitle it was like no curtailment of life and freedom in contemporary india and then i realized that you know i am also talking about resistance and why we should not talk about resistance that is happening in a very like no i will say severe in the like in the background of severe curtailment so it has eight chapters and so first chapter discuss about it takes the breathing as a metaphor but breathing just not about coronavirus it is not just about pandemic because when 
we think about when we can't breathe and that is the name of the chapter then it is not just about like no usual pandemic situation that i'm talking about i'm talking about the kinds of breathlessness and therefore living with the curtailment living with curtailment sense of curtailment that every day you leave every day you encounter some kinds of operation and the you are facing a different kinds of scenario and therefore when i'm talking about breathing then breathing here becomes a sense of metaphor and then thinking through this notion metaphor of breathing i'm talking about the way authoritarianism is taking over all the kinds of like no democratic spaces and whatever rights and the things that we have achieved in like no many years that is like our no, spaces are getting curtailed it is not only the body that is getting curtailed but words are also getting curtailed the way the speeches the whole like no, rhetoric that we are witnessing and that we will see that you only it is sub like what kabir would say sub the sub is also getting curtailed and then i talk about and i will also read a excerpt from this chapter it's called dance of the migrant laborers so where i'm talk about like when in this chapter i'm talking about what happens when migrants laborers deviate from the route so migrant laborers are supposed to like you know work in the kinds of designed route or designated route but when like is there is there a possibility when they are not walking into that route like onto the like going on taking that route then that becomes a problem for the state and i see the witness the like no migrant laborers problem that we witnessed during the pandemic raises some kinds of problem but also generates a lot of possibility for me lot of potentials for the politics for me the chapter starts with a poem by gurak pandey and this is a famous poem i know many of you already know bhaiyon aur behno ab yah alisan imarat ban kar taiyar hai ab aap yahan se ja sakte hain brothers and sisters now the luxurious building is ready to move in you may move out you may leave now adieu from heaven the poem poem poignantly captures the irony of the lives of migrant laborers they lay down their bodies to build the cities they raise the buildings on their heads and shoulders they connect the city with bridges and highways by hanging between poles and wires they give it a spectacular presence with affection with perfection with blood and sweat they make the cities livable they make them beautiful a sight to hold a sight to behold a sight to walk and explore the spaces of freedom but as soon as the houses as soon as the houses are ready to move in they move to they have to move out they leave the site as one leaves their babies and hearts behind this deception of labor does not need a detector it is open and out there when where will they move now perhaps they will move to another site to another city to other jobs seen other cap capacities they may go back to the villages which they call home they will tell you that they are not going to come back again but soon they will be back as their earned wages will, as as their earned wages finish in a days they will be back as hungry homes will run to bite them like hunting dogs without money the poor homes turn into hungry tides they will be back in the city again again as an outsider to keep the city moving it is the movement of the workers that move the surplus for the capital it is the exploitation of the cheap migrant laborers that is crucial for the capitalist growth yet the same movement can emerge as a threat once they deviate from the designated route of the capital what does it mean but what will happen when they own it when are they going to own their own movement what will happen when they start walking back against the desire of the authority against the flow of capital against the performance drive that is driving us to this madness long march let me underline this paradox this is not a long march of any communist party to establish the rule of workers it was the case of a mass exodus exodus of the some of the most precarious laborers in the world the indian authorities sudden announcement announcement in lockdown amidst covid-19 led an unprecedented crisis for migrant workers the nation suddenly turned into zones of confinement overnight the migrant laborers across indian cities were out of work soon they were out of their sanities as owners felt that they could not pay their rents they were out in the streets like a prethas walking in the daylight and the dead of the night they were out in the open without food jobs and a place to stay they were stateless and homeless turning into lesser human beings as there was nothing to lose millions of migrants began a long walk under the lockdown the authorities announced it again a stay safe be at home install the arogya setu app on your smartphone the indian ministry of health and family welfare would announce every time you made a phone call a smartphones a smart city a smart people a smart india is the name of the merit we know 
it appeared that authorities lived in lived in Yahoo land or La 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 land. They assumed that everyone had a smartphone, everyone could down, download apps, everyone could open a website and register themselves for help, everyone had a house to lock themselves up in, everyone had enough food to sustain themselves for months and days. At the height of the pandemic, the authority gave out a contact number that was out of contact. They would give hospitals names that would not admit patients. They offered support mechanism that did not support. The pandemic has proven that pattern movements do not hold political significance. They make you less unless some interruption or reversal occurs. The interruptions possibly change the meaning of encounter itself, as it happened in the case of migrant laborers who were started walking back like moving pretas. They were carrying eyes on their back and were walking towards their front. Soon they become a spectators for the capital as they dance to and off the cut rhythm. The obliged workers become suspects in the eyes of the neoliberal state and their much appreciated movement soon became a threat for the state. The Indian authorities were not concerned about the migrants getting infected. They were not troubled about them returning to their homes. What literally worried the state was the reversal that could emerge as a new potential for the politics. A march that could turn into people's march. They were afraid that they might appear in the spaces of appearance, another name of politics, any day. The fear was that they would gather anytime on the roads and public places, anytime in like and the next time. The situation was alarming because the fear was that they might not follow the warnings. It was a serious case of disobedience. Nothing could be more threatening for the neoliberal orders than the defiance of the surplus armies of laborers. Workers are supposed to work in a set pattern, in order. They have to be in assembly line without the potential of being part of the assembly, which can turn political. Migrant workers walking to their homes were out of that pattern. This is what worried the Indian elites. This is what disturbed the former BJP and member of the parliament, Balbir Punj. And he said, and he said it seamlessly. Fact is migrant laborers behave irresponsibly. Why migrants living in Delhi? For want of money or food? No just irresponsible. There is no money jobs waiting for them back home. It is to utilize their force 50 to catch up with their families or errands back home. The workers are not supposed to go on chutti, holidays or vacations. These informal workers are not supposed to be irresponsible. They are not supposed to disobey orders. They are not supposed to force their decision on the authorities. While the authorities largely saw this crisis in economic terms for the laborers, the crisis was an existential one besides economics. They were ready to take any risks, any risks to go home. They were ready to risk their lives to that extent. We can say that in their extreme vulnerability, they produced a dangerous potentiality. The decision to gather and go home, come what, what may, was, was so extraordinary. It was the birth of new possibility and thus new politics. Critics said that this was a man-made disaster with misplaced priorities. Some also said that migrant laborers were never on the list of priorities. Ranveer Samadhar, in his important study, highlights this connection by saying that the state has over-emphasis on lockdown and under-emphasis on care. But capitalism too cares. Capitalism has acquired emotional intelligence too. It means it can love, it can cry, it can invest in loving, caring, and crying. It can give you more hugs than your mother. It can give you more touch than your lovers. When profit is the aim, care will also sell. The problem is not the care, but capitalism. Capitalism is so careful in caring that it will not be interested in even killing the children of beggars. It would rather have them crippled than be invested in the sentimental capitalism. For capitalist workers are more profitable living than dead. Even if their bodies break, the livers could grow. A worker cannot be more modest than figures of Prometheus. The Greek myth credits Prometheus for the creation of humanity from clay. He is the one who was told fire and defied the authorities. He is the one who remains chained to the rock and is punished for his actions. Every day, a giant eagle sent by Zeus feeds on his liver. Every day, the livers grow back at the night. It is this repetition through which capitalism survives. They, that is, keep ripping apart the liver of the workers. Pause, gauze, plunge, grate, move. Let it grow. Keep repeating it like the dance of the death. Thank you so much, Bram. Particularly the section that you read out uh, captures those elements of the poetry that you bring into your text. But also the play of words. I mean, the, uh, the worker who's on the assembly line but is never allowed to be part of the assembly. 
but it also the poem by Gorak Pandey also reminded me so strongly of how of the uh, account that Archana read, which was you know that uh, you make these t-shirts, but you're never allowed to be part of that supply chain, isn't it? You you have to go buy those secondhand t-shirts. You're never allowed to be part of those uh, to consume the same products that you're making. And uh, I was also thinking about the question of curtailment that you uh, is again you mentioned that it's throughout. It's a connecting thread to our, throughout the text. And yet, you know, in Archana's book, uh, she refers to this idea of labor market flexibility, right? Which is constantly thrown around, that the notion of flexibility. And Archana, I wondered, wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about that while we open up for questions. So labor market flexibility essentially alludes to the view that like any other commodity, the price of labor and the terms of contract should be decided by the market. So should be decided by demand and supply. So, uh, so like any other commodity, it's demand and supply which would determine what the price of labor would be or what the wages would be. And it is the demand and supply which would decide whether the company is going to hire a permanent worker who will have to stay on even when the demand is not there, or will the company hire a temporary or a part-time worker. So this, uh, this flexibility is something which essentially says that let the markets determine the price as well as the work conditions and there should be no constraints. Constraints whether in terms of unionization by the workers which are asking for higher wages or better living, better working conditions in terms of the time of work etc. No constraints in terms of uh, no legal constraints in terms of a minimum wage uh, or a restriction on hiring uh, sorry, it's restriction on firing and retrenchment, which the companies would have to stick to. So basically, all perceived constraints have to be removed. That is basically what the what is meant essentially by labor market flexibility. Now, the flexibility view, to be fair, it also argues that while employers are free to hire and fire, the workers are also free to take the employment or not take the employment. But this truth is actually more nominal than substantive because there is an, it, it ignores the fact that there is an unequal position, an unequal bargaining power between the workers and the employers. So workers are not really free to not take the employment. And what underlies, I think, this idea of flexibility is that one is dehumanizing the workers looking at the workers like economists look at any other commodity where it is a market which would be the sole determinant of prices which in this case means wages the work conditions the time that is extracted from the workers the intensity with which the workers are required to work the market would determine whether the workers would be kept on a permanent basis or a temporary basis so what i argue is that this understanding needs to go and essentially one needs to look at these workers as the forward suggests as flesh and blood individuals these are actual people and the economic policy is impacting them so unless there is a shift in the understanding where the workers are not regarded as commodities which are disposable we this it's very difficult to get away from the situation that we are in I just wanted to uh, conclude uh, this discussion I, with Archana's book. I've seen that uh, it resonates with me as committed kind of field work over several years. But also, as you mentioned, you know, there's this hat of the teacher that we wear sometimes and oh, pretty much all the time. And uh, Archana's book just speaks to that, right? There's so many of these notes uh, that is for the, the student. Uh, as well as a specialist reader, right? And that's what I particularly appreciated and enjoyed, uh, that it's so accessible, both the specialist reader, necessary, but also so uh, you know open to the student. And then, of course, Brahm uh, uses this body as a barricade metaphor and then just unsettles all these thought patterns that one just takes for granted. And both books, as you could have, you would have possibly seen through this discussion, uh, they move beyond the question of work and the workplace to examine life as it stands in contemporary India with all its precarity and uh, injured bodies. 
uh, that we see. Uh, and also, but then again, as Brahm reminds us consistently in his book, which is that the book is about earnest hope in the face of extreme curtailment. Right? Uh, so I hope those who've tuned in, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Do continue to join us on these book talk series that we hope to have every month. Uh, pick up the books. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, Archanas is already available on the uh, website. Brahm Prakash is, is available for pre-order. And I hope you'll pick up the books, share them with your uh, friends, contact the authors, and spread the word. Thank you so much.